so I'm Kai Stotts, uh, the director of SAM at the Biosphere 2, and uh, John, who's going to uh, carry the, the second half of the presentation, is the deputy director of Biosphere 2. And uh, we're going to share with you a little bit about, um, I'll do the first half of the pre presentation, then John will sec jump into the second half. So we're going to share a little bit with you about uh, the history of analogs, just a brief history of analogs, and what we're hoping to accomplish with SAM. And, uh, and then John's going to share uh, some of the exciting things that are happening with the Biosphere 2 as a whole. A lot of us know the history of it uh, through the media and through the stories and documentaries, but we don't know what's happening right now at the Biosphere, uh, which is in, in parallel terribly exciting with, with Sam as well. So just as a, as a bit of a, a repeat or a summary, um, SAM is a high fidelity, hermetically sealed analog and research station um, in which we're really looking at the long duration human habitation for the moon and Mars. Now, Ewan made a good point earlier, a little bit of a, a tongue in cheek uh, sarcasm, but you, Ewan said, hey, you've got both the moon and Mars, they both start with the letter M. Um, and I think under that is, is a key factor that the moon and Mars are very, very different. And, we, we recognize, to be clear and to, and to be sincere about the science of it, we recognize that there are very different components and very different challenges for living on the moon and Mars. And we know that we won't be able to address both of them with 100% with one analog. Uh, but at the same time, some of the things that, that will be, some of the challenges are gonna be similar, which is, as we've seen in a number of the presentations, how do we maintain um, human health, human nutrients? How do we sustain a, a habitable system for long duration without shipping everything in. Now it's much easier to ship things to the moon than it is to Mars, but it's still prohibitively expensive um, independent. I, I don't know the current rates with SpaceX, but it's been something like $17,000 per kilogram to lift anything off this planet. Uh, incredibly expensive. That's obviously just not functional for long term. So in this slide, we have representation of both the mechanical and the bioregenerative means by which we will conduct uh, life support systems. So this is just a montage of not, not by any means all, but some of the analogs that have been done over the years. Um, in the upper left, we have the original Apollo training at Meteor Crater in Arizona. Uh, this is a few hours north of where I live. And this was um, really put in motion by Gene Shoemaker, who I had the privilege of knowing as a teenager and into my 20s. He was uh, the, one of the founders, a member of the Phoenix Astronomical Society and met him through that. Dan Heim, if you're still on the call, you knew Gene really well. Um, in the upper right, we have a neutral buoyancy tank um, at uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. In the center, we have high seas. In the bottom left, we have Hera at Johnson Space Center. In the bottom center, we have the Lunar Palace One. And the bottom right, of course, we have uh, Mars Desert Research Station, which, as we know, has been instrumental in giving so many of us um, a, a kickstart in, in the right direction towards the work we're doing. Um, and this is a list of, now there may be more, these are the ones that I'm aware of. These are the active analogs and research stations in the world today. And again, an analog, is, as Shannon said, it's not make-believe. We're not we're not make-believing that we're on the moon or Mars. We're practicing, we're, we're building systems and processes and testing equipment and testing psychological parameters for what it would be like to live in these difficult situations. And each one of these analogs presents something unique. They're not competitive. And I, and I really appreciate that Shannon um, has said that early on. She said, there's, there's not competition. We all have a place. We all have a role in this. And I think Shannon's going to be very in influential in helping us design SAM as we move forward. So we appreciate that. Um, Poland, the, the Lunaris is a relatively new one. Uh, Cameron Smith uh, with Smith Aerospace is developing a suit, a set of pressure suits for Lunaris. Um, Concordia, of course, has been running for many, many years in Antarctica. Um, Sirius in Russia, which is where um, Anastasia is from and where she's uh, done a lot of her work. Um, High Seas is now under the directorship of, um, of uh, Michaela Musilova, who was one of uh, my former crewmates. So you and Susan and Michaela are all former crewmates from NDRS. Um, Hera is still operational at NASA Texas, and North Dakota has done some great work in spacesuits designs, uh, et cetera. Nemo is an underwater, fully underwater um, habitat that's been running for many, many years off the coast of Florida. So the five principal science objectives, and these again are on the website, but just to, to bring it all back together again, the five principal science objectives at SAM are really transitioning from the physical chemical, which means machine-based, to bioregeneration, which is plant-based life support systems. 
So as we know, there have been analogs that are principally bioregeneration, such as Biosphere 2 and Lunar Palace. They're most analogs, and if you look at the International Space Station as a type of analog that is entirely machine-based. What we've never seen done before, and what we're really excited about, is starting with a facility that is supporting human life through entirely a mechanical means. And that life support system is being prepared and, and given to us, loaned for a dollar a year, thank you, by Paragon Space Development Corporation, which was founded by Tabor and Jane, one of the original, the two biospherians. Um, so we're excited to have this NASA level uh, quality life support system. We're gonna transition from that into plant-based life support. And we're gonna see that, that transition happening in real time with our data monitoring uh, over the course of months and years and finding the balance, how much can we rely on the plants and how often do the machines still kick in when the plants fail or vice versa. That's a really important um, system that we want to monitor because we hope that's what it'll be like on other celestial bodies as we establish long-term habitations. We also want to look at the transformation of regolith to soil. Regolith means uh, rocks that do not necessarily have um, fertile components or organic components. We cannot just directly put a plant into regolith and grow. Um, that's where the movie The Martian wasn't really accurate. Um, there's a lot of toxins. There are perchlorates. There are chemicals that make it very difficult uh, in our current understanding for plants to grow. So we're going to be taking simulated regolith, which is uh, basalt and rock, mixed with some of these nasty chemicals, and how do we take that and turn it into fertile soil? Uh, we're going to be studying the microbiome, as I mentioned earlier. We're also going to be doing a lot of work with pressurized suits in entry, exit, and EVAs in our uh, very substantial Mars yard. And as, uh, the, sim or as the presentation by Ezio uh, stated, we will also be learning a lot about computer models and how closely can we simulate and how can we use the real world analogs to inform the models and prepare better and better models over time. Now, these five science objectives are by no means a limitation. These are uh, five foundations. We expect there to be a lot more as the teams come in, they bring their own science projects as they have done at many other of the analogs. Um, quick summary of where we are with construction. We are funded by the University of, University of Arizona's Tech Launch Arizona for stage one, which is principally the restoration of the test module. And I won't read all these items to you, but I, mean, I'll, I will be posting these on the website soon. Stage two is crew quarters construction, which is installing the three shipping containers, a lot of welding and cutting and assembly, uh, getting the automated pressure regulation system, what the capstone team just described in place, and of course, installing the Paragon uh, CO2 scrubber and uh, eventually more advanced life support systems. Stage three is the build out, which is the really fun part where we get to go in and install all the wires and the connections and the sensors and the data systems. And this is where it gets to be very technical. This is the fun part. Well, it's all fun part, but this is, I think for those of us who are computer geeks, it'll be even the more fun part. Um, and then of course the Mars yard. Now these stages may not happen exactly in this order, but this is how we've designated the pieces and this is how we've uh, established the, uh, the principal funding agents. So um, I'd like to uh, let's see the next slide. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to hand it over to John at this point, who would, who's going to talk a little bit about the uh, the history and the current state of the biosphere. So John, if you're ready, I am. Thank you, Kai. So you know, it's it's great to have the opportunity, and thank you everyone who you know has joined in and participated either for part or the entire uh, SAM symposium. You know, it's great to have everyone and the wealth of expertise, as Kai has indicated. Um, just a little bit about who I am, because I, I know many of you, but not all of you. I've had the good fortune of uh, working at Bias for Two now for over two decades. And as Kai had mentioned, uh, you know, my current role is deputy director, but um, everyone here at Bias for Two uh, has a lot of hands-on um, responsibilities. So it's great because we all get involved in what's happening. And, you know, SAM is the latest research endeavor, and it's exciting to see the research portfolio at Bias for Two continue to grow. And I'm going to I'm gonna start uh, with the outside and some of the new initiatives, and then I'll move to what's happening under the glass, as we refer to it within Bias for Two. So uh, recently we've partnered with Stewart Observatory, and as I'm sure many of you know, university just has an incredible scientific history and current endeavors as it pertains to space and space exploration, uh, looking and monitoring space with building uh, mirrors, with that, uh, we've erected and put up a 6.1 meter radio telescope on site. 
uh, with Lunar and Planetary Labs uh, on the Bias for Two property. We've also recently put up, uh, in conjunction with one of our faculty, Vishnu Reddy is his name, um, five space situational observatories. Um, we're going to be adding a sixth one here uh, this come well in next year early spring uh, so we're excited about that um, and then under the glass it's been you know an incredible amount of science that primarily focuses on uh, understanding the impacts of global climate change on systems and so starting with that large pyramid like structure on the left if you're not familiar with bias for two that's our tropical rainforest system um, there's been some incredible research looking at CO2 sequestration and where saturation points um, are and with these systems and helping to validate uh, existing models, looking at thermal tolerance of vegetation. Here recently, we just had a paper published in Nature Plants. Um, and the significance here is, yes, looking at the photosynthetic capacity of these systems under higher temperature. But I think the real takeaway is that these systems have uh, better resiliency than what maybe we had anticipated. So that's exciting um, and we're continuing to use that. And we just completed a large international project actually about a year ago, just before sort of everything went crazy with COVID, uh, an international team uh, originating from some folks in Germany at the University of Freiburg. And the reason they approached us and wanted to work with our team in the Bias for Two Rainforest, there was, there was no other place where they could set their instrumentation up make sure everything was running, capture that initial baseline of data, and then turn the rain off in our tropical system for over 70 days, um, add different isotopic tracers in the system through this duration of the drought, and then be poised to capture its response when it was rewetted. Um, those are the types of things you can do inside Biosphere 2. Uh, likewise in our ocean system. So this is a system that's nearly a million gallons. It's the world's largest experimental uh, reef or ocean tank. And, and I recognize that there are many tanks uh, around the world and even here in the US that are bigger um, in a lot of these widely recognized aquariums. The difference is, is that uh, they're trying to maintain pristine conditions for the organisms they have and they want to not stress them. Well, our ocean system um, is exactly the opposite. It is an experimental system. And uh, some of the most significant research to come out of Bias for Two um, early on, in my opinion, originated in this system as we showed a direct connection between increasing atmospheric CO2 and decreasing coral calcifications because we were able to manipulate the chemical composition of the water to simulate what it was going to be like essentially today, because this research was done a bit ago, um, in that ocean system and show that those calcification rates slow. Today, uh, we are actually revamping or re-engineering the ocean system there are a lot of questions um, pertaining to, can we build more resilient reefs? And the reason it is extremely important to try to understand that is we see reefs um, dying at an accelerated and alarming rate worldwide, primarily as attributed to coastal increases in temperature. And there are a lot of researchers who have shown that there are certain um, species within uh, groups that have increased resiliency. What gives them that resilient resiliency? Can we selectively breed them? And they've done that and they've tested and they show that they have that resiliency, but there's no place where they can actually put them in more of an in situ or natural setting and understand those population and system dynamics um, because typically coastal areas are not gonna allow you to do those things in the different uh, government agencies. And so we can do those types of things in bias for two. Uh, first and foremost, I think, you know, one of our collaborators, I think, said it best. Those things that you're afraid to do outside, you can do inside bias for two first. Um, and the final area, which is really exciting, I think has lots of applications to what we're going to be doing in SAM, and Kai mentioned it as one of our experimental points, is the development of regolith. So inside of the, there's three arches that you see just behind the white structure of that dome. That's one of the taller points. Um, this is the site of LEO. This is a Landscape Evolution Observatory. This is the University of Arizona's institutional research project. This is where we began renovations first when the U of A took over nearly 12 years ago, uh, the Bias for Two research facility. And inside there, we have three large slopes. Uh, these slopes have um, our lysimeters. So you heard from our folks at SEAC of how they're weighing, uh, they were weighing the, that Mars lunar greenhouse where we're weighing these. These are the world's largest weighing lysimeters. And uh, we have over a meter's worth of uh, vol volcanic basalt 
uh, that's on each of the three slopes, one per vault that you see in that chamber, and nearly 2,000 sensors and samplers embedded in that soil. And, and the premise for this experiment is it rains in the mountains, how much water ends up downstream for you and I to use, and how is the quality of that water impacted as the landscapes evolve and change. Um, and so just as a prime example, that mountain range you see right behind Biosphere 2, uh, virtually the entire system burned uh, this past summer in a very dramatic forest fire. And we know that those types of changes in the vegetation and the landscape very much change the dynamics of the water cycle, how much runs off, how much is retained. But yet we still know very little about what happens subsurfacely. And so we have begun, much like what we'd like to do in SAM, is starting with just a pure regolith system. We are volcanic material system. It was relatively void of microbial communities. We ground it to a loamy sand and we've added water, water to watch its weathering. That weathering releases nutrients and turn feeds microbial communities. And we've, begin, we've been able to watch these communities develop in place over the past five years. Look at how the current hydrologic models predict the behavior that we're observing on the slopes. And in this coming year, we've just brought on a new senior research person. His name is Scott Seleska. He was on for a bit. Uh, they're actually got a meeting uh, coinciding with this one as they're writing a large grant to NSF to put plants on LEO. And so it is our intent this coming year to add biological input into this material and look at ter in turn how it changes dynamics. So we're really excited because I think, you know, everything that's going on around the campus very much complements uh, what Kai and others have put together as it pertains to SAM. Excellent, thank you, John. Um, and uh, by the way, Biosphere 2, just so everyone knows, is open for, for tourists now in a very safe COVID envi or safe environment uh, with, uh, with personal, uh, you can use your cell, or cell phone to walk through with an app. So we can talk about that later. So just quickly, um, wanted to go through just a few more slides. This is, as Tabor showed, uh, the test module back in the 80s. And um, oops. Oh, there we go. And wanted to give an aerial view. Uh, this is a Google map of the existing biosphere we were looking at from up here coming this way. This is where SAM is going to be developed and we're going to be leasing this property um, to, to further develop SAM. As you can see, the buildings are not a great state of repair at this point. So we have a lot of, um, of, uh, of tearing things down, fixing things up and rebuilding. Um, this is just as of Tuesday when uh, Trent and John and I walked through the facility. You can see some paints falling off. It's, uh, it looks bad, but it's actually in really good shape after 30 years of, of, of very minimal maintenance. It's amazing how everything's still sealed in with overall speaking, relatively little work. We're going to get this thing up and running again. The hapalon uh, membrane, which is this really thick neoprene-like membrane, is still flexible and pliable. It hasn't dry rotted uh, with very little repair. We're going to get that up and running again for the lung. This is going to be the location of our Mars uh, yard. This is a very large 80 foot by 80 foot building, um, and there are essentially three times this much space that will be available to us if all goes well. This is the interior. Um, of the Mars Yard. Our goal is to take down the panels but leave the structure in place so that we can put shade cloth over the top to simulate the amount of solar radiation that lands on the surface of Mars. Um, so we're much closer to that. And uh, again, most of you have probably seen the renders. These are by Brian Bierstig, um, who maybe Brian's on the call by now. Um, so Brian is a very talented uh, space artist and architect. He spent uh, more than 10 years developing not just artist versions, but actually looking into the science and the architecture and the engineering of what it will take to build um, habitats on the moon and Mars in varied uh, gravitational wells and also different conditions. Um, so this is, if all goes well, this is what Sam will look like uh, about six months from now, if we can move that quickly. And uh, again, Brian's uh, version of the interior of the test module. This was based on actual measurements that I made um, and sent to Brian. He built a 3D model of it. So um, first off, is Brian, are you on the call by any chance? Did you make it in? Okay, I don't think Brian made it. So I will go ahead and give Brian's portion of his presentation, but I wanted to just share this. I, I, I love this, this, this brief sentence that really summarizes what we're trying to do. We're engaging research teams from around the world in a hands-on scientific discovery um, and to inspire the next generation 
to be engaged custodians of this planet while we're exploring new worlds. And that for me helps satisfy the question I hear many times, which is, why are we going to another planet? Why are we becoming interplanetary when we have so many problems right here on Earth? And I think it's very important to recognize that every time our species has moved from one continent to another, from one region, from one valley to another, we often inspire, we come back with inspiration, we come back with new ideas, we create trade routes um, that, that result in technology and knowledge exchange. Um, and, and maybe someday we can have Cameron, who's an archeologist and anthropologist, give us a better understanding of that. But I really believe that, that by preparing for our, our species and helping us become interplanetary, we are in fact improving where we live right now. Um, and then before I go into to give Brian's presentation, I do want to thank everyone on uh, my, my close-knit wonderful team uh, with Brian and, um, and Trent and Jean and Cherry and Kevin, uh, Ezio and Joaquin, uh, Sherry, John, um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, sorry, uh, Jean, Jacques, Mass, and Marat, and um, Yuri. And uh, I don't, don't think I missed anybody. Anyway, so it's a wonderful team. Uh, some wonderful people to work with. You guys have been fantastic and made all this possible. Uh, thank you. Kai, a question for you. Yes. What is your view of the uh, relationship between the lunar, uh, sorry, the, the lunar greenhouse that we have in one of the lungs and, uh, the, and Sam? Is, I mean, I know that there's connections with the technology for both, but is there any use in trying to actually use one of these green, greenhouses as part of the complex? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, Jean and Marat and, and Michael and the team and I have had a number of uh, conversations about this. Our current understanding, our current expectation, this may change over time, is that the, the Mars Lunar Greenhouse is an experimental facility. It's something that you can go in and experiment with processes and systems with different kinds of plants. If it doesn't work, you reset. You know, it's, it's a, a day or two to reset, to clean the plants out and to start over again with something new. And Sam, because it's hermetically sealed, because we're monitoring the microbiome, because we really want to treat it as more of a functional uh, habitat, or as, as Shannon said, an operational habitat, we're going to be doing a little bit less experimenting within Sam. And we don't want to have to reset on a regular basis. Certainly, biologically, we won't be able to reset all the way down to the microbiome. So in that respect, our current understanding is that the Mars Lunar Greenhouse projects um, and there, you know, there's the four at, on the SEAC campus, and there's the one at, the, um, at, at Biosphere 2. That will be more of an experimental realm. And from those experiments, we can bring at least one level of tested systems into SAM and say, this is what we learned from the Mars Lunar Greenhouse. This is how we expect that it will behave in SAM. Let's introduce it to SAM and see how it does. So the risk uh, is slightly reduced. Uh, in that respect. And, and I'm not saying that's the only way in which we use those, but from my point of view, that's the means. Now, to answer your second part of your question, I would love to see at some point something like the Mars Lunar Greenhouse, if not the Mars Lunar Greenhouse, be attached to SAM into extending into the Mars yard. And we're hoping to create a, a rather flexible environment which we can add modules onto SAM over time. And that would be a true test of the Mars Lunar Greenhouse as if it can maintain a seal um, and, and how it would perform under that pressurized environment. Does that thank answer you. your question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, Robert, I um, understand you have a question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> the plus one positive pressure inside SAM that you will mechanically sustain with the pressurizer and the uh, system that was uh, graphically portrayed to us. How does that interact with the thermal expansion contraction, quote unquote, lung concept of the elastomeric membrane? Uh, how does that work with the plus one positive pressure? How, how does, what's the interaction? The answer is very carefully. <laughs> yeah. the, the, I can tell you what the goal is and how it actually wor works out. We'll find out. So you're, you're, it's a very astute question. So the test module, as we know, comes with its own pressure regulation system, which is the lung. And that is a gravity fed system. It's passive 
and, it, and we're gonna be resealing and repurposing that system. So the test module, meaning the greenhouse, will have its own pressure regulation system built in at, at once we refurbish that. Past that airlock I talked about, the, the, the airlock between the greenhouse and the living quarters, that's where the differential between those two environments will, be, uh, will meet. And then within the crew quarters, the living space will be the pressure regulation system that the University of Arizona capstone team is designing. So there'll be two separate systems, one of them active, one of them passive. And from a purely science standpoint, it'll be really fascinating to see how they behave as independent units which one is, is more prone to failure, which one works better. Um, not that a passive system would necessarily work in an atmosphere, an atmosphere reduced environment, um, but we have to, it'll be a fun experiment to see now how they meet together in that airlock. We, we can do some modeling, but I think ultimately we have to build it and find out. It might be that every time you open and close the door, there's a gust of wind. It might be that we're able to maintain the uh, pressure regulation system of the crew quarters to match that of the greenhouse. We could put a pressure sensor in the greenhouse and have the crew quarters match and maintain the same pressure so there is no gust of wind when you move between the two systems. That's entirely within our reach, uh, given the automated systems that uh, the, the capstone team is integrating. So part of it we can model, part of it we can, we can estimate, and some of it I think we're just gonna have to build it and see what happens, and that's part of the, the joy of, of the discovery. Any other questions? Uh, so what's the size of the crew? Uh, right now we're limiting the crew to four. So it'll be a maximum of four people. Uh, the carbon, uh, the uh, CO2 uh, sequestration system or the scrubbing agent by Paragon, if I remember correctly, is designed for up to seven. That would be pushing the limits of what that's designed for. But we're gonna maintain a comfortable crew of four and we'll have sleeping, uh, sleeping capacity for four. That doesn't mean that we might go higher or lower in the future, but that's our, our nominal goal. Hmm. Hey, Kevin, it sounds, like, it, it sounds like an honors college experience. <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> no, I think it's terrific. I, it's an opportunity for our students. We also recognize that the, it's very unlikely that the test module itself will have enough capacity in a three-dimensional volume to produce all the food. We don't expect that. We're not shooting for that. The goal is not to be 100% self-sufficient. The goal is to augment what would be uh, freeze-dried or, or you know, introduced foods. Um, so we'll probably always be bringing food into the environment, but every time we can harvest vegetables, every time that we can eat fresh from the greenhouse, uh, that's a benefit. It's a bonus. It means we're, we're tapping into our resources of uh, procured foods less, and that's the entire goal of this project is how can we transition from bringing everything from earth to using what we have right with us, you know, right there in that, in that facility. If we do get a chance to add on, for instance, a Mars lunar greenhouse, perhaps we could get at some point to 100% you know, internal food uh, generation and consumption. That would be a long-term goal. Let's see a uh, question. Let's see, Sean. Um, oh, Sean wants to apply. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Oh, Frank, uh, your hand is up. Go ahead. Yeah, as mentioned by Sean, um, <clears throat> the science and the rest is done by the crew. I mean, for some, do we think to do you think to apply the same model or mixed model? You have already made your mind on that. Yes, no, that that's good. Um, good question. So the question is, you know, at, at MDRS, the the science is is designed and conducted entirely by the crew, and we will follow a similar model in the sense that we will be bringing in and inviting um, and and. Uh, responding to, to uh, team solicitations from all over the world. So we hope to have teams coming every year from all over the world, bringing their own research. I think the difference will be that um, as, as Tabor and Shannon both you know, expressed, we have a fairly, uh, I wouldn't say rigid, but we have a sophisticated system that is hermetically sealed. So there's gonna be a little bit more maintenance, a little bit more uh, requirement of those crew members to to work to sustain the, the system, the mechanical system, and also to work to sustain existing 
uh, experiments. So I think it's going to be a blend of both, that when you come to SAM, you'll bring your own science, yes, but it's also understood that whatever science projects are already running, you will be trained in and expected to continue those experiments on behalf of either prior visitors um, or the SAM system itself. So it'll be a little bit of a hybrid of both. And I, I, I'm hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, that there's enough time in each mission uh, for that. I would just like to mention that um, that's extremely hard to do. Uh, early on at MDRS, we had a terrific uh, science team and um, all science projects were vetted. We designed experiments that we had crews uh, that were multi-crew experiments. And the amount of effort and quote unquote nagging required to follow through on those experiments when they're not somebody's experiment is really, really hard. Currently, um, our two requirements are maintenance of, maintenance of the facility. Nobody goes in, even though I'm on site, and maintains anything except the power system. Um, and they are required to keep the plants, uh, keep growing plants, planting plants, and harvesting plants in the greenhouse. And the, that takes more effort than everything else to put together. It's a very, very hard, just per be prepared to have people who oversee all of those experiments that you keep running because they will be the first thing to get ignored by a, a crew that is not involved in them. And, and it's doable, but uh, I, and I did it for a long time as the remote science team coordinator, um, but the amount of time is considerable. Um. We did some um, monitoring of how much labor it takes to run the uh, Mars Lunar Greenhouse once it's in operation. So from the time of transplanting to the time of harvest. And <clears throat> depending on the system design and expectations, uh, it's, it turns out to be minutes a day. Um, however, those busy days of transition from at harvest, <laughs> cleanup, uh, and then, you know, transplant, that's, that's certainly a, a, a very busy time. So I think we could look into um, the design of the, the growing systems in the future and, and not only consider how capable are they of producing the crop with limited resources or, or very efficient at doing it with the resources, but also uh, consider labor as a resource. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Well, Kai, I would just like to thank you. Uh, this is uh, one of the most exciting sort of mornings I've had in a long, long time. So thank you for organizing it. And thank I, I would like just to thank all the speakers and uh, the experience they bring to the table is just amazing. So thank you to all. Um, and thank you, Kai. Well, and th thank you, Joaquin. It's, it's been a pleasure to work with you and, and John and Cherry and Kevin. And, uh, and, and Jean and Murad, I, I have to say that the although I don't have experience in a lot of universities, of the four or five universities I've worked with, there's something special about what's happening here. And with the University of Arizona and Biosphere 2, you guys, are, you're open to ideas. You don't say no before you say yes. And, and that takes, that's a risk, you know, on your part. When I met you two and a half years ago, um, I might've just been that crazy guy with some ideas. And, and now we're seeing this come to fruition and that's in no small part because of your support and because of your steadfast commitment to helping us make this happen. So I really appreciate it and look forward to the next uh, number of years of working with all of you.